I'm about to say something so contradictory, it may seem painful. <clears throat> Destiny is a game that tries to cater to every player out there. Destiny is a game that tries to cater to one aspect and not every part of the game. Yeah, that hurt. I know, that sentence by definition is an oxymoron but it's the driving force that has made Destiny a flawed masterpiece. It is the oxymoron that keeps the debate raging on, but it is the single most important point for this conversation. The question is simple and needing an answer. Which DLC is the best ever made? Is it the Witch Queen, Forsaken, or the Taken King? Is it none of these? Are all of these DLCs horribly flawed? Are they seen in rose-tinted glasses? Or is there some merit to one argument over the other? I think it's safe to say that this video is going to receive a lot of back and forth from anyone interested in Destiny. So it is my job to be as objective as possible, then throw in some of my own personal experience. I have been playing Destiny since vanilla and started creating content during the end of the Forsaken era so my views can be seen as somewhat biased. But I will do my absolute best to be as fair as possible to both without my bias reaching in. This topic has become the heart of the discussion in the Destiny community for some time, and with the game on year 8, it's not hard to see why. Bungie has gone from Halo Glory with Microsoft, to Activision money for Destiny, to breaking away from Activision and going independent, to now being owned permanently by Sony. So it's safe to say that Destiny has felt those impacts over its lifespan. There is always going to be asterisks in some players' eyes because of these changes. All of these DLCs do some things great. I would even say better in some ways than the series had ever seen. But they weren't all perfect, and they all had their own issues too. So finding one superior is not as easy as it may seem. An odd discovery I made in doing the research for this video was that giving credit to these DLCs greatness also came at the cost of the game struggling the years prior. It's an odd discovery, but an important one in weighing which DLC is the best. I think I've talked up a pretty big game, but now it's time to decide, and I need your help on this one in the comments or anywhere else you can find me. Which DLC was the best? Eyes up, Guardians. Some footage in this video is from players around the community. Their links will be in the description of this video, as well as the music, too. Oh, I'm so happy, enjoying my fast food. Oh, I wonder who it could be. Dr. Fresh, with my friend, Chef CB. Dr. Fresh, Chef CB. What are you guys doing here? We are here to tell you about how to make HelloFresh. What is HelloFresh anyways? HelloFresh is a fresh food delivery subscription service with mouth-watering ingredients delivered right to your door. Seasonal delicious recipes that you cannot resist. That sounds great, but how does it work? I will let my friend Chef CB it is sustainable, easily obtainable, and delivered right to your door. It is healthy. It will help me and you today. If you grab this healthy food easily in a box, no more restaurants. No more at going to the grocery store for the shops. You just get to eat. Wow. Wait, so you're saying I just get the recipes and cook what's inside the box? Yep, it is foolproof and done by professional chefs. Well, that sounds great. I'll get to cooking right now. Hold on, you must look professional before you can cook professionally. Whoa! Wow. HelloFresh recipes include pre-portioned ingredients that means less prep for you and less wasted food. HelloFresh saves me time from going to the grocery store and planning meals. This means I get to spend more time making videos for all of you. If you want to cook meals nice and easy and learn from the best, like Chef CB and Dr. Fresh, 
It's really simple. Just use code HOGEVANF16 at checkout or click the link down in the description or on screen as you guys can see it. For 16 free meals and three surprise gifts, thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring me on this video. And back to Destiny. Major DLCs for Destiny should be seen as more major updates to the core of the game and the systems that intertwine between. Bungie does add content to every facet of the game in some way, but their focus is usually on achieving a grand state of a specific thing. For example, in The Witch Queen, the game may have received some updates to the core experience, but it is easy to see that the main focus was in the story the Witch Queen provided. With the Taken King, the focus was clearly aimed at writing the criticisms of Vanilla Destiny away. The same can be said for Forsaken in regards to Vanilla Destiny 2. Let's go chronologically for the sake of this video and start with The Taken King and what made it so great to players in 2015. You need to look at the landscape of video games at the time for a good comparison to see what Bungie was up against. This was the year of the struggling FPS. Rainbow Six Siege dropped with a bag of issues, the same way that Battlefront 1 had its own issues. Overwatch wouldn't take over the world for another year, so we're left with Destiny's crowning jewel, the Taken King, to bring in all of the players at once. If I had to give credit to the Taken King for a release, it's that the stars align for this DLC. We wouldn't find out until later that the Taken King was actually cut content from the vanilla Destiny story, and that Oryx was supposed to be a part of Crota's raid, but Bungie made a coherent story about a big villain with a new location, and it mostly worked. It was the first time the series made jumps to this extreme, and there was a lot of new in the game, like a new leveling system rework, new quest system, an actual campaign, new currencies, PlayStation exclusive bull****, a new location called the Dreadnought with its many activities and quests. There were four new strikes, eight new crucible maps with three modes, three new subclasses, 30 new exotics, 100 legendary weapons, 30 new armor sets, and kiosks were introduced. Vault space was expanded, there was a chase and an expansion of factions, there was balance, and even a new ghost to go with everything else. I've got a bad feeling about this. I've got a bad feeling about this. The Taken King, by all metrics, was a home run for the sheer amount of content it provided and a lot of people would call the argument over and done with right there for that reason. But there were some major flaws it had as well, and flaws that Bungie has corrected in the future. The Taken King had a story, but I would argue that Oryx was not an interesting character outside of the lore. The Taken King had a vast quantity of content, but I would say that a lot of the armory fell short. You give someone a nice shiny chess piece and they may bask in the excitement of getting it to drop, but then realize all it does is drop more glimmer on kills. It's not to say that the Taken King didn't reinvent Destiny, because yes, it did. It's to say that it wasn't all perfect, and it's to say that it's at liberty of being the first to play with so much new at once. I think to not focus too much on every small detail, we need to look at the best the Taken King delivered and what kind of DLC it was, then compare why it didn't work for other DLCs in the future, and finally look at what didn't work here and why Bungie ultimately shifted away from those parts. So what worked well? I would argue that the things we listed were all gains for the game, but what really worked for the Taken King was a focus on three main components. Activities for levels in the Dreadnought, meaningful loot with a meaningful chase, and a focus on the ultimate replayable activity to shoot your new toys with, PvP. A new leveling system was introduced that would do away with all of the leveling up of pieces of gear and weapons the vanilla game introduced, with Infusion saying that every weapon or armor piece could be at max level. It wasn't perfect, and I can remember having a calculator app for Infusion ready to go, but the new leveling system gave incentive to Bungie's activities all over. I'm going to sound like an English professor and someone that's way too high on their horse 
when I say that Bungie followed a pathos, logos, and ethos model in The Taken King, meaning that they gave credibility and trust, emotion and value, and logic and reason to this entire DLC. What I mean by this is that only very few cases kept you out of the Dreadnought, and most new levels for the new loot to then feed into the loop of doing even higher level activities were found in this place. The Logos established things like the Court of Oryx, the Secret Worm God Chess, the exploration of the Calcified Fragments, the new strikes in PvP maps, and more were almost all involving the Dreadnought. The Taken King had to establish the ethos of making sure the loot you were earning was worth your time. And it sort of delivered and sort of didn't. The Taken King came out with some new weapons and armor, some fun to be had with the new Three of Coin for the random drop exotics, but a lot of the exotics were behind pretty boring exotic quests I would argue. I would say that establishing the care for the loot was mostly one however, because the guns were so good that we are still using the basic carbon copies of them today. The final step in the Taken King would be to establish activities that were replayable with your new toys, and I would say that the Taken King did deliver here big time, and this is where you could argue that the pathos came into play. Establishing that emotion of getting attached to your gun was, and still is, something Destiny does a great job of. When you have 8 Crucible maps and 4 strikes, I think it speaks for itself in terms of replayability and establishing that connection to your gun in something meaningful. Basically what I'm saying is that PvP, when it's good and has reason to be there, is always going to be the most replayable and best portion of Destiny. The Taken King delivered in being a monumental piece of content that dropped all at once, and kept players happy for about a month or two. And I know that I've just talked a big game on it, and you're going to be surprised to hear this, but I don't think it should be in the same conversation as the next one. Any last words? <coughs> How's your sister? Destiny 2 Forsaken launched on September 4th of 2018, again in direct response to the vanilla game prior, and again, Bungie had seen tremendous success with this project, this time having the help of three total studios and nearly infinite resources backed by Activision in 2018. Forsaken did... Look, you're probably wondering why I didn't put the Taken King in the same conversation, right? Well, we just went over how the Taken King competed in the era of the struggling FPS, and how the stars aligned for the game in a way that... Well, start scratching lotto tickets if you're Bungie in 2015. But this was also before a game industry-wide shift would happen, and a lot changed in gaming from 2015 to 2018. We entered the Battle Royale era, and while Destiny 2 in Year 1 built itself on the model of Overwatch in competitive PvP, Destiny 2 Forsaken would have to compete with a new model introduced by some games at the time, but popularized by Fortnite called the Every Week Model. While the Taken King gave you everything at once, and then an impressive update with Sparrow Racing in December, then later an April update, it was very much a product of releasing the content all at once. Video games change when Fortnite took over the world, and now you cannot find a popular game out there that's online that doesn't follow the Epic Games model and stay relevant for more than a week or two. Focus shifted from selling copies to weekly player counts, and Forsaken adapted this model so grandly. So while we can say the Taken King took strides and for its era of game was the best DLC, we are talking about two very different games. Forsaken launched with what I would argue was a Taken King level of content, and for your ears sake, I'm just going to scroll through how much content there was with all of this. There was a focus on weekly new content with a new seasonal model throughout the year, so if the Taken King delivered a juicy amount of content for players to soak in for a month or two, then play other games, Forsaken delivered that level of experience with the new model and an ever-changing world in the Dreaming City. 
The English teacher's talk of the pathos, logos, and ethos was delivered here and felt like the ultimate one-up of the Taken King. Then we have seasonal content later too. If the Taken King had the Dreadnought, Forsaken had the Tangled Shore in the Dreaming City. If the Taken King had the villain Oryx, Forsaken had Aldrin Sav being possessed by a magic dragon who was being controlled by Savathun. If the Taken King had the best exotic weapons, Forsaken had the best exotic weapons and armor. If you get my point. It was meant to one-up and improve everything the Taken King had done, and to be a DLC for the players that loved Destiny. Forsaken is still Bungie's ultimate crowning achievement to this day, but they also had three studios working in tandem together to deliver it, something that no other major DLC would have. Forsaken did have one major issue though, and one that would be hounded by critics and fans alike. The game was just getting too wide. There was so much focus on new content, and with the brand new season pass model, new content in wider scopes is what you got. There was no hard mode raids the way the Taken King had. There wasn't a focus on just the Dreaming City. Instead, there was a focus on the entire universe of Destiny. Forsaken at launch came out with what I'd argue to be the best expansion of meaning put into the Dreaming City, giving incentive to level up to be ready for the raid and brand new dungeon, the first dungeon of the series, the Shattered Throne. Forsaken also had what I'd argue to be dartboard activities in its seasonal model, and from the different studios working on different seasons, it made sense as to why this was the case. You see, one season may have been a grand achievement in storytelling, meaningful loot, secrets, the whole nine yards, while another season just did not build on top of those blocks, instead opting to do something entirely different with systems that felt more like a jump back than a step forward. That's about all I can say for the negatives of Forsaken though, and if we're just looking at the content it provided at launch and not the season pass, it already takes what the Taken King did and expands on it in the most important parts. The best way I can summarize this feeling is in the first mission in the Dreaming City. You enter the city you've been told is legendary. You see the characters you will face later on. You spot parts of the city that will become explorable one day. And you're told there is an immense creature at the heart of the city. So your goal is to get ready. I think that about does it for the Forsaken talk. It had to compete in a much more difficult game's climate, and it stood in the face of all doubt and abandonment the series had seen. It is, for now, Destiny's Magnum Opus. Truth is a funny thing. Destiny 2 The Witch Queen released on February 22nd of 2022, and to many critics and fans acclaim, this DLC delivered a story unlike anything other the game had seen. In previous years, it felt as if the story was just the first step to the rest of the experience. In The Witch Queen, Bungie delivered a story that was the focus, while the rest of the game was the more shallow pieces. The Witch Queen introduced legendary campaigns similar to the hard mode in Destiny 1, but much harder with a new modifier. Season of the Risen, which had some tie-in to the main Witch Queen story. The beginning of reworking light subclasses in Void 3.0. Eight exotic weapons with six exotic armor pieces. Supplemental post-campaign missions, a raid, weapon crafting, the light hive lucent brood, two strikes, the new throne world destination with its activities, over 40 weapons returning in new, a new weapon type called the Glaive, and some tunes to the overall game. The Witch Queen is a part of the new era of Destiny, the Independent and COVID era. Sony may have just acquired Bungie for billions of dollars, but this version of Destiny is in the Independent era of development. The games that Bungie was head-to-head -head against to start 22 were… well, in their own genre, almost nothing. The same week Elden Ring and Horizon Forbidden West released, but those aren't games to rival Destiny, and so Bungie could have had another stars aligning moment after Beyond Light was met with mixed opinions. This era of Destiny is in what I would call the Marvel formula. 
Bungie presented a roadmap to Lightfall, then expanded further to the final shape. So it had felt like Beyond Light was taking jumps to get the story ready for Savathun. And while I do think the campaign delivered and the throne world delivered, this focus on the story and only putting pieces of the remnants in the overall game has changed players' perceptions of Destiny a lot. What was once an outstanding amount of content with a self-contained story in this gigantic universe that felt alive has now, for better or worse, become a narrative that feels like it's building to a big moment and has made the whole world feel tiny. We are forced into a horizontal 2D timeline of events that we know will not fully satisfy our hunger, but instead be larger appetizers leading up to a big meal in the years later. Or so we hope. Imagine Forsaken to be a turkey dinner with sides to complement, and the Witch Queen is a fancy presented piece of sushi that is one bite to enjoy. You love the taste, but you're always craving more. I think the Witch Queen delivers in expanding systems like RNG of weapons into craftables, and I think the Witch Queen does a great job of delivering what it promised. But unfortunately, I think the Witch Queen feels formulaic and dry in terms of what these other two DLCs have done. We may be in a different era, but the Witch Queen is still following the Forsaken rules. In my time with the Witch Queen, I have felt like it delivered a throne world with mechanics that have been expanded upon previously in the series, but that I have seen before. A story that gets me asking more questions for the next chapter than a self-contained answer. If Forsaken took what were the three components that made the Taken King work and expanded upon those, then the Witch Queen took what Beyond Light and its systems had and expanded upon those. Most of the leveling is still prevalent outside of the new activities, and the game as many have stated, just feels old. There may be a new engine, but without the rest of the parts to support the car, it can't be that dream mobile that we know it can be. It sounds like I hate the Witch Queen, when that's not the case at all. Bungie has taken steps to ensure the car will be moving forward for the remainder of the year, and in their own words, the Witch Queen will be the biggest year the game has ever seen. We still have all of the seasons to remain, and Bungie's work behind the scenes needs to be given some credit too. There may not be an exotic called Crossplay, just as there may not be an exotic for separating and properly balancing a sandbox. And there is a raid boss named COVID-19, but those steps were taken to ensure the new content would be pushed out. I just really hope that means we will see the core of the game get the love it deserves, and Destiny can return to being this gigantic world that knows no bounds. I just don't think I like the Marvel formula stretched out to Destiny but it's the commitment Bungie has made and one that we will need to see play out. So, which DLC is the best? Well, for those who listen this far, it's obvious what my opinion is, and that is, the best DLC is the one you fell in love with first. No, it's Forsaken. Forsaken just expanded upon the most important aspects of Destiny for me and it made the world feel even larger than what the Taken King was able to accomplish. If the King walked, then Forsaken ran. The Witch Queen can achieve this standard though, but we must wait out the rest of the year. I want to know what you guys think one more time after you've heard all of this. And if you did enjoy this video and me rambling on about Destiny history, I encourage you to subscribe. I also encourage you to follow my socials and join my Discord. I have listened to requests about the Rolk merch, and now it's available as a display, in case you want to scoop that up. Thank you all for watching, and have a wonderful day.